You are listening to Vote Her In, a collaboration between two broads talking politics and author Rebecca Sive, where we look at the movement to elect our first woman president. On today's episode, you'll hear from Congresswoman Cindy Axney, who represents the 3rd Congressional District in Iowa. Everyone, this is Kelly with Vote Her In. Vote Her In is a collaboration between Two Broads Talking Politics and author Rebecca Sive, where we look at the movement to elect our first woman president and related issues of women's political power. So I am joined by Rebecca, who will introduce our guest. Hi, Rebecca. Hi there. Glad to be here, even if it's getting toward winter in Chicago. But I imagine that's true in Iowa, too, right? <laughs> so, Congresswoman, we're delighted to have you with us today. And as Kelly mentioned, you know, we're focused a lot of the time on the issue of how to elect a woman president next year. And more broadly speaking, the idea of a executive political power for women in addition to legislative power. And I know you uh, have an instructive story for our listeners about that. You've both been a legislator as you are now and prior to this an appointed executive. So we thought perhaps if you could start by, you know, sharing with our listeners how you decided once you were already a community leader then to take these other two steps and what you might share with them about the decisions you made along that path. Thank you so much, first and foremost, for having me here. And yes, it is getting too cold in Iowa at this point. So, uh, <laughs> But, you know, that's a great question because, to your point, we've got to see more women in executive roles uh, and elected uh, positions to be able to get a female president. Uh, I think that certainly having women uh, in charge uh, at the decision-making table provides for more thoughtfulness around the solutions that we put in place. So for me, it really was about taking uh, that background that you talked about, uh, whether it was uh, the work that I'd done at the state of Iowa under three governors, both Democrat and Republican, um, in leadership development, as well as overseeing strategy for the state and then running key uh, departments within some of the big areas of government, you know, gave me a really solid understanding of how we actually implement policy, how to, when something goes through and it has to get passed on to the executive branch to implement it, if it's a health issue in the Department of you know, Health and Human Services that has to implement it, or economic development, or the Department of Transportation, you know, a lot of times it's easy to craft a policy and not think about how it will be uh, enacted when it gets down to the nuts and bolts of a department actually putting it in place across multiple states in this country. And that information and that knowledge is really, for me, something that's helping me in my role right now um, to understand what types of structures and resources are needed after a policy is, is worked on and is voted on and passes. What will that look like from actual real implementation to actually help people? And that's something that I bring to the table that I think is different from some of our other lawmakers. But I certainly would say the impetus to uh, running for this, the, the race that I did, which was Congress, is really the idea of, of thinking that as a mom and as a community organizer and as somebody who does have executive experience, uh, uh, listen, I've got as much skill set as any of the guys that tried to step up and run for this seat. <laughs> and when, <laughs> when, uh, when I took a step back after the presidential election, and really, you know, said, this is not what our country should be. If the decisions that are happening right now are hurting me and my family, I know they're hurting families across this country. And I just decided to step up. And so I often say to people, step up, because you just don't know where it's going to take you. Uh, my, my direct decision was not to run for Congress. It was just to step up and do more because I didn't like the way our country was moving. And it led me to a seat at the U.S. House of Representatives. 
So you have a, a story on your website that I just love about how the the first thing you really stepped up for was getting a full day kindergarten for all the kids in the school district instead of by lottery. As a as a mom myself, I know <laughs> how much how much we have to uh, to really advocate for our kids. And you know what what do you think that brings to sort of your uh, your outlook on on making laws on, on thinking about the policies that really affect people? Well, first and foremost, I think there's nobody that will fight for families and children more than moms. That's for darn sure. Because we've already done it for our own communities, like I did with getting all-day kindergarten in West Des Moines. You know, it just wasn't a good answer. Uh, Everywhere I turned, I found out that half the kids literally lost a lottery and got an inferior education. They got a -a two-and-a-half-hour kindergarten as opposed to all-day. So they lost out on the arts. They lost out on physical education, half the math, half the reading. And this is in a district that said their mission is this, you know, this, this great education for everybody. Well, not when it's only for half the kids to start out. It's the most important learning time in their lives when they're young. So I fought for that, and it took about a year. Uh, what I learned from that is that even though you know it's the right thing to do and even though you're trying hard to make sure that it happens, There are too many people who look at every obstacle possible and see it from that perspective as opposed to the outcome that you're trying to achieve, which is what's best for our community. And I think what I learned from the entire experience is that I'm going to constantly be put up against battles with somebody who just doesn't want to deal with the issue, who doesn't think it impacts enough people who, you know, never really is too busy to begin with and doesn't want to deal with it. And you just got to keep fighting for what you want. And that's what I think women do best. I stand and we get the answers that we know are right. Uh, we don't back down until we know that we've protected our community. And that was a learning experience from that. So when you talk about not backing down, but at the same time, being an official in government, something I've had some experience with, uh, you know, sometimes one has to back down just to sort of either keep the peace or make a compromise. It's a different sort of experience, for instance, from being a community leader in, in that respect at times. And I wonder if you can talk with the listeners and share with us, you know, how you approached and were successful in that a point of career and specifically how that gave you the confidence to leap into running for office, you know, at a fairly high level to start with, that is in Congress. I mean, how you managed that, how you negotiated that path while being, as you said, a full-throated advocate and mother uh, working for children. Well, and and you're absolutely right in regard to having to compromise to to get things done. And, And we absolutely continue to still have to do that in Congress and need more opportunity across the aisle, uh, you know, to make that happen so we can actually move some of these agendas forward. But what I always go back to are the facts. I'm a journalism undergrad. Uh, I'm an MBA with a strategy and operations and organizational performance. So my whole, my whole background is about finding the facts, dealing with research and data, and then finding a better solution. And I've found that you can often get people who don't agree with you to begin with over to your side if you do two things. First and foremost, you stick with the facts. You don't take things personally. You talk about the issues as they are. What are the pros and cons related to those? And also, what are the outcomes that we're achieving as a result of some decision that has been made? And what unintended outcomes have we created because of that? Secondly, you have to listen to people because they will, they, we might in, in all reality want to get to the same outcome. But we look at things from a different lens, so we have a difficult time understanding that that person even wants to get to that same outcome. We come to the table thinking, well, they probably have extremely, they have extremely different viewpoints than I do, so they probably don't even want this as a solution. A lot of times that's not the case. It's a matter of the means to get there that we disagree on. So you have to be really open to listening to people to find out where you have an opportunity to work with them. And many times that's a little, a little bit of an opening that you get. It might not be the solid answer right away uh, to get to an outcome that, that you're looking for, but it gives you an opening to have a conversation with somebody and to discuss with them on a personal level 
their beliefs and why they why they believe something should be a certain way. If you discount that immediately and you come into uh, any meeting and you know this is your viewpoint and you automatically assume that theirs is different and you are trying to place judgment on them on why you think it's that way, then you've shut yourself off from any opportunity to find consensus. So even though I've worked for both Democrats and Republicans and both both administrations, I've learned early on that if you stick to the facts and that if you truly listen to people, you're going to find some opportunity to work with them and move the agenda forward. You've been in your district a lot doing uh, town halls, and I know that can be very challenging when there are, you know, it's a it's a swing district, so there are definitely uh, lots of people who, who may or may not agree with you. What are you finding when you talk to people in your district? Is that, does that approach work when you're sort of explaining things to your constituents as well? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, you're right. I've been named the most accessible member, uh, freshman member of Congress now twice this year. So nobody is holding more uh, public events than me. Uh, and my goal is to make sure that I'm getting out and listening to the people in my district and quite honestly, finding solutions for the issues that we're facing from people in my district. Iowa um, has is a flyover state. Uh, you hear that term all the time. And honestly, there's a lot of parts of it where I understand why people feel that they've been left behind and forgotten. And be true to who Iowans are um, because of that, and they need to solve a problem, in many cases, they just went ahead and did it on their own. So they're very innovative. We've got a very innovative and thoughtful uh, group of constituents. But we do have opposing viewpoints, and so they do come out uh, and talk to me at my events. And as a matter of fact, I was uh, named one of the eight most crucial races in the nation. So the Republican uh, National Party has already put in ads against me and started sending people out to all of my events. So I will have pushback. I had it to begin with, and now it's only going to increase. And, and again, I will go back to a lot of uh, you know those key talking points I just mentioned, the facts, honesty, and hard work. Uh, you know, when, when the initial pushback came for opening up an impeachment inquiry, uh, I was able, and folks said, well, now you're only concerned about that. You're not focused on the work of the people in your district. My response back was, and I was the only member of Congress on the day of the impeachment inquiry to drop an agriculture bill. So I am focused on the district. I'm working to make sure that we get what we need here in district. And so I know that if I do my job the right way, if I protect the interests of the people in my district, my constituents, if I'm honest with them, and if I do the work that I say I'm going to do, I've always got an opportunity to fall back on the truth and explain to people where I'm at with things. They might not always agree with me, but they have a better understanding of where I'm at. And as a matter of fact, I've had uh, Republicans come up to me, a lot of women, by the way, and say, you know, I don't always agree with you on everything, but you're working hard for us. You're, you're, you're fighting and standing up for our needs, and you're thoughtful in your decision-making, and I really appreciate that. And, and, and they say, so I'm going to vote for you next time. So they're looking for champions. People are looking for people who will stand up for them. Don't always have to agree with everything. I mean, think about it. Do you agree with everything your husband says? I sure don't. And so, you know, but we're still in it together. And I think that that's what I can, I'm can. getting out of a lot of my constituents is support because they know I'm working hard for them. So related to that and related to the reality that, you know, there are these opposing viewpoints in, of course, in every district, you've run on a strong pro-choice platform and uh, we'd like to, you know, hear from you about your pro-choice position, how you discuss that in the district, how you represent that in the Congress, and specifically why you think that's crucial to a woman who holds public office and wants to really help all women. Well, uh, so as you know, grow, uh, growing up in Iowa, and I'm also Catholic, uh, my dad's side, of, I, on his side of the family, we were the only Democrats. Everybody else was Republican. I've been called the baby killer my entire life, so I'm very familiar with uh, folks who are on the opposing side of this. Listen, uh, women's reproductive freedom is that, uh, I will always defend that. When women can choose when and how they start their families, then they have control over their future. And that is a level of equality that every single person in this country should have. So women always have to have 
the opportunity to make the decisions for themselves that are in the best interest for them and their families and not have that controlled by government uh, or, or, you know, their doctor. This is what needs to be done is that conversation with the women. The only people that should be a part of that, uh, you know, conversation is the, is the woman and her family and what she would like to do. So I will always be supportive of a woman's right to choose because it is truly an essential piece of that woman's economic prosperity and the opportunities that may open up for her in life. Um, and that's her choice to make, no one else's. So I will always stand by that. I've done that my entire life. I've been, as I mentioned, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I'm used to in this district and it's something I'll never back down from. Well, I would uh, just say we're very glad to hear that. Obviously, our listeners are predominantly pro-choice, if not all of them, and we see it as critical and not uh, never backing down either. I, I'm wondering if you could share with us how you think that your uh, policy profile uh, prepares you if you have the opportunity, and we hope you will, of course, to go back to Congress to do more and in a year when we're working hard to elect a woman president. What do you think are the key elements of that campaign and that and the voices that we ought to hear? Well, I, I think it's the idea. I'll tell you what. I know I, I love I love all the guys that I work with. And of course, you know, men are great. Women are we just work nonstop for our communities. Every little detail has to be addressed. And we're the ones who stay up late at night and think about those little things and wake up in the middle of the night when one little tidbit hits us. And it might not be somebody might not think it's that relevant, but we might think it's the, it, this could be the straw that tips this thing over. And so we're thinking about these things. We're getting up in the middle of the night and either you know putting a note in our phone or writing on a quick piece of scratch paper so we don't forget that. How do you take every single thing that you're doing and take it up to a level where you can have success with it and not miss a beat? And I think really that's what women bring to the table. They, they bring in all these pieces um, from folks that they're meeting with or representing, and they're using all of that information to find a better answer to whatever they're dealing with. And they don't miss a beat when it comes to looking at the small fine-tuned details of it, because the devil truly is in the details when it comes to so much of the policy that we're writing. Uh, so, you know, I think from a, a women's perspective, to your point, it's so important to have our voices heard in Congress and uh, in the Oval Office at, at executive levels all across this country, um, just because of the fact that we, we, can, we bring a different uh, process of thinking about things to the table. Uh, we're much more holistic in how we look at issues, uh, and we certainly are uh, collaborative. And there's data, and I know you're fully aware of this, there's data that shows that countries with more, more women in, an elect, in elected offices are more peaceful and get more done. Uh, we don't, you, you can physically see it in the way we walk the hallways, in D.C., you know, we're, 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 we're getting our job done and we're moving on to the next thing uh, and, and we're, you know, firing on all cylinders. And you can physically see it in, in just how we do our job. So I think that's just women's nature um, to be able to multitask and handle so many things at the same time and do so with grace and with thoughtfulness. And that's why it's so important to bring that voice back to Congress and expand it within the halls of the White House and, uh, uh, you know, make sure that we've got representation. So I have a, a quick Iowa question. So I, you know, I talk to people all over the country who are running for office and very often they say most of their constituents or their prospective constituents aren't spending nearly as much time thinking about national politics as people like me are. But is that true in Iowa, especially in a presidential election year when they get to see presidential candidates every day? You know, do you find that people are still very much uh, just concerned with sort of the kitchen table issues or is there a little bit more of a, a nationalized uh, thinking about politics in Iowa? Uh, you know, you would think that it's all about the presidential race at this time when we have events like we did the other night with 13,000 people. But truly, it, it really is the kitchen table issues and how you put food on the table and afford your medicines that people are worried about. You know, my district has the uh, most populated county in Polk County, where Des Moines is and all the suburbs, and Ringgold County, one of the least populated counties in the district with under 5,000 people. There's a town there called Mount Air where folks had to pool their money together to buy new street lamps for their town square because there was no local money for that. 
Now, if that happened in Des Moines or Chicago or any place else, you better get that fixed within 24 hours or, you know, all hell's breaking loose. And so um, that these truly are people who are working two jobs to make ends meet. I've talked to young women who are trying to put themselves through college. Um, you know, they're in their young 20s that are taking care of a child uh, and they're working two jobs at the same time. And they don't know if they, you know, if they can pay for their electricity next month. So it is very difficult for them to think outside of just their everyday life and what tomorrow holds. So although there's all this excitement about the presidential election, the majority of people uh, still have not paid as much attention to it as you would think. And I think, you know, we're going to we'll, we'll see what truly happens when people turn out uh, for caucus in February um, and then, of course, for the general. But right now, people are focused on, you know, lowering their health care expenses and making sure that they have better paying jobs to put more money in their pockets. So we know you're busy and on the road, speaking of upcoming elections and caucuses and all that. So we wanted to, first of all, thank you for sharing with us. And to say to you, we hope you'll keep us posted on what you're doing and perhaps join us again. And, of course, we wanted to uh, let our listeners know how they could be in touch with you and your campaign. So by all means, give a shout out with the website address or whatever else you'd like. Love it. Yeah. So Cindy Axney, spelled A X like an x-ray, N is in Nancy, E is in Edward, is what I say all the time. So Cindy Axney for Congress.com. You can find that's our website. Uh, you'll find us, how to, you know, like us on Facebook there, Twitter, all of our social feeds. Um, but get involved. We'd love to have you. I need all the support I can to keep this seat. Keeping Midwest Democrats is so crucial to the Democratic Party. And certainly keeping those in seats that are mine, that are purple, we are we are absolutely changing the hearts and minds of people in the heartland who previously supported Republicans and now see that Democrats have their back. So your help is crucial in that. Excellent. We'll put that link up on our website as well. Thank you so much. Have a great time. We're, for our listeners, you should know that the congresswoman's been calling us from the car and is on her way to yet another meeting, and we wish her safe travels both here in Chicago and back to Iowa. So thank you again. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for the time. The Vote Her In segment is a collaboration of Two Broads Talking Politics and author Rebecca Sive. Our theme song is called Are You Listening off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at Two Broads Talking Politics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at Two Broads Talking Politics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.